Today we're going to cover the first four bowl judgments in Revelation 16, verses 1 through 9. So why don't we stand for the reading of God's Word, and then we'll pray. Scripture reads, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent. They did not repent and give him glory. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you for this time this morning in your word. We ask and pray that you use it for good. Help me to set forth that which you've given me to declare this day. Help people to want to dig deeper into your word, to understand your ways and your thoughts uh, because of what is preached here today, O oh God. Use it for good in each one's life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. Now, throughout this book, we've been... We've seen Old Testament apocryphal judgment language employed by John over and over again. And it's been my contention since the beginning of this book. The book is not to be taken literally, as the futurists teach. Rather, the book, as is most all apocryphal judgment language, is to be taken symbolically. And as I've proven time and time again, even the futurists take it symbolically over and over again. They just want to say it should only be taken literally for certain points of passage for the futurist idea that uh, works for them and makes things seem better for them and their schematic of eschatological events. For example, in verse 3, when it says, It became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died, they'll say, Well, that's never happened ever in time. So, of course, these things still have to be in the future. Well, why would you take that literally and not symbolically? when everything around it and the entire book is symbolic in nature from the very beginning, we've been pointing that out and we continue to do so. Throughout this book, we have seen Old Testament apocryphal judgment language employed by John over and over again. We have seen John employ the imagery of judgment and plagues against Egypt prior to the Exodus. We see all that in Revelation 8 and 9. And of the commencement of natural Israel as God's people after the exodus from Egypt on Sinai. We see John using language which is similar to that language used of the exodus and commencement of the Old Testament covenant being used by John regarding the commencement of Christ's kingdom and the New Testament covenant, which is being dealt with here in the book of Revelation. Here in chapter 16, we see again similar language of the plagues and judgment brought against Egypt now being applied to natural Israel themselves. The seven bold judgments are not judgments brought against the world generally, but as we know contextually here in this book, they are being brought against natural Israel specifically. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the end of the entire Old Testament sacrificial system are in view here regarding the book of Revelation. And it was all fulfilled by 70 A.D. with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. You see John using similar language here that was used when the Old Testament covenant was established with natural Israel. Transitioning 
to the New Testament covenant being established with the church. Remember I talked about that last week? In the Old Testament, God used natural Israel as the vehicle through which he made himself known in the earth. Now, he uses the church. The church is made up of all those who repent and believe in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. The church is the vehicle through which God makes himself known in the earth. Remember, I covered Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, through Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. It's as plain as sea spot run there. That this is the vehicle through which God makes himself known in the earth now. It's the church, no longer natural Israel. The book of Revelation is not about an ending. It's about a beginning. The book of Revelation is not about a conclusion. It's about a commencement. It's not about the end of the world. It's about the commencement of Christ's kingdom in the earth. The only thing that's an ending of is the ending of the Old Testament sacrificial system and natural Israel being the chosen people of God. The chosen people of God now are all those who repent and believe in Jesus Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. It's not a conclusion. It's not the conclusion of the world. That isn't what this book is about. Rather, it's about the commencement of Christ's kingdom in the earth. It's a totally different view than what's popularly taught in American eschatological circles today. Nevertheless, it was the teaching of the church. What I'm presenting to you, the predominant popular teaching of the church for the first 1,800 years of of Christianity. The eschatology we have today has just become popular over the last 150 years. Natural Israel, which was persecuted by Egypt, uh, as we've seen already and we'll see again here in chapter 16, natural Israel, which was persecuted by Egypt, is now the persecutor of the church. Natural Israel, which was persecuted by Egypt, is now the persecutor of the church. As we've seen by looking at the book of Acts and the epistles, plus what Christ himself had to say about natural Israel and history itself, First century history itself reveals natural Israel, who were once persecuted as the people of God, are now persecuting the people of God. The seven bowl judgments in Revelation 16 correspond with the ten plagues poured out on Egypt in the book of Exodus. There is also a marked correspondence between the seven bowl judgments here in chapter 16 and the trumpet judgments of chapters 8 through 11. Just compare them. The difference is the trumpets were lesser in their judgment. For for instance, only a third of the things died in the sea. Whereas here, everything dies in the sea. The trumpets were lesser in their judgment or were warnings. And that's how God always is in his judgments. He brings judgment, gives men space to repent. They don't repent, he brings more severe judgment. Remember when he brought the trumpet judgments, it says they would not repent. Now he brings the bold judgments, and here we see again in verse 9, they still won't repent. So, they did not repent. So let's continue on here. Verses 1 and 2. And let's cover these verses. Verse 1 and 2 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. This judgment corresponds with the sixth plague on Egypt found in Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 11, where the boils came upon the Egyptians. Here you have loathsome sores talked about. Boils in regarding the plagues against Egypt, loathsome sores regarding the judgment of natural Israel here in Revelation 16. Those who had the mark of the beast got these sores. They wanted the mark of the beast, and now God has put his mark, his mark of judgment, on them. Natural Israel did receive the beast's mark and worship the beast, which was Rome. 
in that they looked to Rome to persecute the people of God, namely the church of Jesus Christ. Again, those who were once persecuted as the people of God have now become the persecutors of the people of God. Those who once saw the enemies of God plagued and judged for mistreating them are now being plagued and judged themselves because they've become the enemies of God and are persecuting the real, true people of God, all those who are Christians who have repented of faith in Christ. Remember Revelation chapter 2. Turn with me there. Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. It's talking about natural Israel. That bulk of Jews who refuse to convert to Christ. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. The Jews did this in virtually all of the cities addressed here in the book of Revelation. They would use the Roman state because the Christians refused to participate in emperor worship. They would use the Roman state to have the Christians persecuted. There in verse 9, God calls the Jews who say they are Jews and are not, he says, because who is a true Jew now, according to the New Testament? It's one who's been circumcised in the heart, not merely in the flesh. Someone who has repented of faith in Christ is declared in the New Testament by Paul to be a true Jew. And in chapter 3, verse 9, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. This is what Christ is saying to his church, to all those who have repented in faith and believed in Christ. The Jews think they're the people of God. They are not, and they are persecuting the true people of God, the church of Jesus Christ. God's letting them know he's going to recompense them for the sufferings they're enduring at the hands of the Jews. Remember when I went through the book of Acts? Verse after verse after verse. The persecution the early church suffered was at the hands of who? The Jews. Over and over and over again. God says here, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Amen? Those who once were persecuted as the people of God are now persecuting the people of God. And God is going to bring his righteous judgment against natural Israel. He's going to cut them off as his people, annihilate Judea and Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and end the entire Old Testament sacrificial system to make it clear to the whole world that it's through Christ alone and his shed blood that gives men right standing with him. Amen? Amen? John is using the imagery of the ten plagues on Egypt to show the transition that is being made from natural Israel being the people of God to the church being the people of God, whether Jew or Gentile. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. He uses the same imagery that was used when God commenced his Old Testament covenant. He's using it as God has commenced his New Testament covenant. Isn't that interesting? Again, Ephesians 2, 11 through 3, 10 make it clear that God, in C-spot run fashion, God has made the church the vehicle through whom he makes himself known in the earth. Remember God warned natural Israel that boils and sores would come upon them if they persisted in their rebellion against him? When he first established his covenant with them, back there at Sinai, after he had just delivered them out of Egypt, and put all the plagues upon Egypt, he warned Israel if they persisted in their rebellion against him, all these terrible things that would happen to them. And one of them was that they would have boils and loathsome sores. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 27. God spends the first, I believe it is, 14 verses 
talking about the blessings he'll bring on natural Israel if they follow his law. If they reject his law, he spends the next 50 verses talking about all the curses and judgments he'll bring upon them. Think God might know a little bit about the nature of man? <laughs> has to tell him a lot more about cursings than about blessings. Of course, in American Christianity today, 99.9% .9 of what you hear from American Christianity is all about the blessings. If you ever hear anything about the judgment of God, it's so rare and infrequent. And most American Christians do everything they can to apologize for God's righteous judgment in the earth. It's despicable. Anyways, he says here, the Lord will strike you, this is one of the things he'll do, with the boils of Egypt, with tumors, with the scab, and with the itch, and from which you cannot be healed. This is what's happening in Revelation 16. The very boil, the, the things that came upon the enemies of God when they were the people of God are now coming upon them because they have become the enemies of God and are persecuting the true people of God. Isn't that amazing? Look at verse 35. The Lord will strike you in the knees and on the legs with severe boils which cannot be healed and from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. John is employing this same apocalyptic judgment language that was, in, was used regarding Egypt and natural Israel. He's now using regarding natural Israel and the church here in Revelation 16. When you read Josephus' account of the condition, remember we've talked about Josephus, um, he was there, an eyewitness of all that went on, and he wrote, historically wrote, an account called the Jewish Wars about all that took place with the Great Tribulation from 67 to 70 A.D., what all happened to the Jews, even on into Masada. He was there, eyewitness account, Josephus. When you read Josephus' account of the condition of people's physical bodies in Judea during the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in the temple, this clearly happened to the Jews of that time. Josephus said of those who suffered the degradations of the Roman siege at Jerusalem, which culminated in the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., quote, for their bodies had terrible boils breaking forth with blains. They have much other things to say about their physical condition, too. In verse 3, the scripture goes on and says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Every living creature in the sea died. This judgment corresponds with the first plague on Egypt found in Exodus 7, 17 through 21. Blood, by the way, is mentioned four times here in chapter 16. Instead of the waters of the river turning into blood, as it was with the Egyptian plagues, here it is the sea turning into blood. The sea turning into blood. And again, every single creature doesn't need to die. It's apocalyptic judgment language, meaning things are going to be really, really bad. Remember how many times in the past I have showed you Old Testament apocalyptic judgment language by the prophets where this type of language is used and it didn't mean it happens exactly like that. It means it's going to be really bad. So in the future I say, oh, every last creature has to die and that hasn't happened yet, so this all has to be in the future. Baloney. You have so many contextual hermeneutical problems coming to that conclusion that it ain't even funny. And that's where I strike my complaint with them. And that's where I argue from regarding them. And that's what I have no good answer from the futurists regarding, ever. Whether I've talked to one-on-one -on -one or whose writings I've read. Listen to Josephus' account of the Roman massacre of Jews after the Battle of Terakea in 67 AD on the Sea of Galilee. Here's what Josephus said regarding the sea full of blood. He said, The Jews could neither escape to land where all were in arms against them, nor sustain a naval battle on equal terms. Disaster overtook them, and they were sent to the bottom, boats and all. Some tried to break through, but the Romans could reach them with their lances, killing others by leaping upon the barks and passing their swords through their bodies, sometimes as the rafts closed in. 
The Jews were caught in the middle and captured along with their vessels. If any of those who had been plunged into the water came to the surface, they were quickly dispatched with an arrow or a raft overtook them. If in their extremity they attempted to climb on board the enemy's rafts, the Romans cut off their heads or their hands. So these wretches died on every side in countless numbers and in every possible way until the survivors were routed and driven onto the shore, their vessels surrounded by the enemy. As they threw themselves on them, many were spared while still in the water. Many jumped ashore where they were killed by the Romans. One could see the whole lake stained with blood and crammed with corpses, for not a man escaped. During the days that followed, a horrible stench hung over the region, and it presented an equally horrifying spectacle. The beaches were strewn with wrecks and swollen bodies, which, hot and clammy with decay, made the air so foul that the catastrophe that plunged the Jews in mourning revolted even those who had brought it about. How many of you have read The Jewish Wars by Josephus? One person. I encourage you to read it. When you read the account of what took place there, some people say it's, you know, Christ said it would be the most horrible thing. Again, it's apocalyptic judgment language Christ was employing there. But when you read Josephus' uh, account in the Jewish wars of what took place, if you can't walk away with it being one of the most horrible events in the history of the world and how men suffered, you're blind. And it's amazing how the accounts of what took place there give credence to what Christ said at Mount Olivet and what Revelations talks about having taken place from 67 to 70 A.D. So I encourage you to read it. As I have asserted since the beginning of this book, most of what Revelation talks about was fulfilled by 70 A.D. in time and space. In verse 4, the scripture goes on and says, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. This judgment corresponds with the first plague on Egypt directly. Both back then in the book of Exodus and here in Revelation talk about the rivers being turned into blood. Now, when this judgment is declared, notice the angel of the waters comes out to make a decree about God's righteous judgment. Yes, God judges, despite what all American Christianity would have you believe, God does judge in the earth. Look at verses 5 and 6 at what the angel of the water says. He says, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Notice this angel rejoices in God's righteous government of the world. Notice he doesn't act squeamish and try to make apology for God's judgment in the earth, like American Christians do. They have attacked God's people, natural Israel has, as we saw repeatedly in ad nauseum in the book of Acts, and as is known in general first century history itself, so they are deserving of the righteous judgment of God. As it says in verse 6, for it is their just due. Amen? They've lived in rebellion to God. God is cutting them off. He's no longer going to use them as the vehicle for which he makes himself known on the earth. He's established a new vehicle. It's called the church. It's not made up of one racial geographical people. Rather, it's made up of every tribe, tongue, and nation of the earth. Everyone and anyone who repents and believes in Jesus Christ is part of the church, whether Jew or Gentile. When they were God's people, they killed the prophets, and now they persecute the saints, as it says in verse 6. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets. Who are they? It's natural Israel. This is the testimony of Scripture over and over again. Both in the Old Testament, Christ Himself, and within the New Testament. I could give you dozens of verses. Let me just give you a few to prove my point. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter 36. Natural Israel is the they. 
Second Chronicles chapter 36. Verses 15 through 17. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them. To who? Natural Israel. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, talking about the prophets, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people till there was no remedy. This is a testimony of Scripture in the Old Testament that they killed the prophets. This is a testimony of Christ himself. Also, turn with me to Luke chapter 13, 33. Luke chapter 13, verse 33. Look what Jesus said. He said, nevertheless, he's talking to natural Israel here and their leaders. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Amen? It's the testimony of Christ Himself. Who is they? It's natural Israel. They killed the prophets. And they also began to kill the saints. Turn with me to Acts chapter 7, verse 52. Acts chapter 7, verse 52. Remember Stephen preaching to his natural brethren, the Jews? He says, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge him with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Here Stephen talks about how they've killed the prophets. And now here they are killing the saints. They killed Stephen and they were responsible for killing countless other Christians. And they often use the arm of the state, Rome, to accomplish that end. The Jews martyred and persecuted many Christians. As mentioned before, four times blood is spoken of in this chapter. They have shed the blood of the prophets and the saints. Now their blood shall fill the seas and rivers of Judea. Josephus' account shows all this took place. Remember I read to you before Josephus' account how blood was everywhere throughout Judea during the Roman siege. All has been reversed. Those who were once persecuted as the people of God now persecute the people of God. And look what verse 6 of chapter 16 says. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. You know, God used to say this about natural Israel's enemies. For example, just one place, turn to Isaiah 49, verse 26. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 26. God said, I will feed those who oppress you. Talking about those persecuting natural Israel. I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. 
Now hear God saying it of natural Israel himself, that he's going to give them blood to drink because they've now become the persecutors of God's people because they haven't gotten along with God's program. They refuse to repent and believe in Christ. They've rejected the gospel. They've lived in rebellion to God over and over and over again, and he's cutting them off as his chosen people in the earth. All is reversed. Their enemies, when they were the people of God, who spilt their blood, were given blood to drink. Now they are the enemies of God's people, and they are being given blood to drink. And we know historically that this was true. Josephus, again, read the Jewish wars, said that the Israelites actually became cannibals during the siege of Rome against Jerusalem. Mothers literally ate their own children. Also turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28 again. God had warned natural Israel there at the commencement of the Old Testament covenant, what would happen to them if they did not live according to it, if they rebelled against him, all the cursings, judgments, and plagues that would come upon them if they turned from following him. We looked earlier at Deuteronomy 28, verses 27 and 35. We'll look at verses 52 through 60. They shall besiege you. This is what will happen to them. Here you see it coming to pass in Revelation 16 and in time and space with the Roman siege of Jerusalem from 67 to 70 A.D. He says, They shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout all your land. And that's exactly what happened throughout Judea, including the mighty walls of Jerusalem. And they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters whom the Lord your God has given you, in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat, because he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. The tender and delicate woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and her daughter, her placenta, which comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears, for she will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at your, all your gates. Read the Jewish wars. This happened in time and space. When God brought his righteous judgment upon natural Israel, cut them off as his chosen people, and brought an end to the Old Testament sacrificial system forever. They will not rebuild the temple they will never sacrifice animals again. I don't care what anyone tells you or tries to sell you. God ended that thing. goes on and says, If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses, Moreover, listen to this, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid and they shall cling to you. Here we have it in Revelation 16. John using the imagery of the plagues that were brought upon Egypt now being brought upon natural Israel. Those who once were the persecuted as the people of God have now become the persecutors of the people of God and God is bringing his righteous judgment upon them. Josephus repeatedly talks about the amount of blood flowing in Judea during 67 to 70 A.D. He says in one place, for example, and I quote, Most of the slain were peaceful citizens, weak and unarmed, and they were butchered where they were caught. The heap of corpses mounted higher and higher about the altar. A stream of blood flowed down the temple steps, and the bodies of those slain at the top slipped 
because of all the blood, to the bottom. Unquote. And God's judgment is just. Even the saints who were martyred saw it as just. Look at verse 7 of chapter 16. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Who were these in the altar? The martyrs, remember? Chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Turn back to there. Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. It was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Who are those in the altar that were saying this in verse 7? Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. It was the martyrs. Those killed. At the hands of the Jews and the Romans. Who said this. That his judgment is just. How does that square with the loving phoniness of American Christianity? The false love of American Christianity, which has been embraced. They've simply embraced the false love that the world teaches. They have no understanding of true love for God or their fellow man. Otherwise, they would understand how right and proper what the martyrs say here is. They would understand how right and proper what the angel of the water says here is. Now, in verses 8 through 9, the scriptures go on and says, Then the angel, the fourth angel, poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Again, the futurist says, well, that's never happened in history, literally. So, of course, this all has to be future. Again, it's apocalyptic judgment language. The judgment corresponds with the seventh plague in Egypt found in Exodus 9, 23 through 24, the hail mixed with fire. Natural Israel had enjoyed the blessing of God and that they had been protected from the scorching heat of the sun. Now listen to me, when you read the scriptures, you see over and over again that this was part of the covenantal blessing of God upon them. That they were protected from the scorching heat of the sun. Even when they were being delivered from Egypt, the pillar of cloud went with them by day to protect them from the scorching sun. Exodus chapter 13. But you see throughout scripture in many places, I'll share with you but a few, that being protected from the scorching sun is a sign of God's covenantal blessing upon natural Israel, upon his people. Turn with me, for example, to Psalm 121, verses 5 through 7. Psalm 121, verses 5 through 7. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade. At your right hand, the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. Here you see, part of the covenantal blessing of God upon his people is, they'll be protected from the sun. He brings them shade. Amen? Look at Isaiah 49, verse 10 as another example. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 10. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who, is mercy, who has mercy on them will lead them, even by the springs of water he will guide them. See, being protected from the scorch of the sun is a sign of God's covenantal blessing upon his people. Having unbloodied water is a sign of God's 
blessing upon his covenantal people. Amen? Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. For its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Look what even is said in Revelation chapter 7, verses 15 through 17, regarding God's covenantal people the people of God. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger nor any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of waters. Being protected from the scorching heat of the sun is a sign of God's covenantal blessing. God has removed His covenantal blessing on natural Israel. They are now exposed to the scorching heat of the sun. That is what's being spoken of here in verses 8 and 9. Natural Israel would no longer enjoy the blessing of God. They were now deserving of His righteous judgment. As it says at the end of verse 6, it is their just due. The implication of Scripture, notice verse 9 here, and the men were scorched with great heat. They blasphemed the name of God. And you just read the Jewish wars. See the degradation and suffering people went through regarding just the elements, being exposed to the elements and the suffering they went through. It is unbelievable. They blasphemed the name of God and Josephus even talks about that. How the people would blaspheme the name of God openly. The suffering was so great. They blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. They did not repent and give him glory. The implication of Scripture saying here and they did not repent carries the implication that God's righteous judgment is intended to produce repentance. Amen? God uses His kindness to bring men to repentance. The Scripture speaks of that. But the all, Scripture also speaks repeatedly how His judgment brings men to repentance. The fact that Scripture mentions the fact that they would not repent brings up the implication that God's righteous judgment is intended to produce repentance. And in this, His judgment, His mercy is seen. His mercy is seen even in His judgment. How much better that judgment come upon rebellious man rather than the Lord allow rebellious man to continue on without consequences. That's how the American church talks about love today. We should just love them. We should just love them. I, I, I hear this regularly now. Christian churches, we pass out water to them. We don't talk to them about their sin. We just want to love them. These are Bible-believing churches. How reticent even are the best of Bible-believing churches to talk about sin and God's judgment upon man. Men's being abiding under His wrath. Their need to turn from their sin. Amen? And be saved from His wrath. That's why I say the American church is a whore. They can't even get the most basic rudimentary thing down. How to win men to Christ. Ray Comfort's right. Churches are filled with false converts. They're brought into the Moose Club. They become Moose Club-like in their behavior. And so they think they're all good with God. And they've never truly repented and believed in Christ. They've never seen how awful their sin is in the sight of God. They haven't been radically transformed by the power of His Spirit. They've just become American Christianized which is a pretty pathetic standard of Christianity when you read church history. How much better that judgment come upon rebellious man rather than the Lord allow rebellious man to continue on without consequences and never change. His mercy is found even in his judgment. 
Now, next time we'll conclude chapter 16 in the final three bold judgments as we continue on in the book of Revelation. Let's stand up and we'll have a word of prayer. Lord, we give thanks and praise to You. We rejoice in You. and Lord, we so desire to see You glorified in the earth. Lord, the first question of our catechism, the Westminster Catechism, what is the chief end of man? To live, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We so desire to see You glorified in the earth. Do it through our lives, I pray. May we not live our lives in self-ambition, in self-wanton pursuits, but may we lay our lives down before You. Take up our cross and follow You. Do that which You desire to do through us in the earth, whatever that may be. Glorify Yourself through our lives. We ask and pray, Father. May we stay true to You as those who truly love You become more and more persecuted, not only by the state, the media and academia, but more and more by those who claim to be Christians are the true Christians being persecuted in this country, O oh God. The tongues are wagging. The desire to run to the state and turn in their brethren is the same as the Jews of old in the first century towards the Christians. It is unbelievable to see the state of your church here in America, which has refused to be the salt that you call us to be. And instead, we see your righteous judgment upon us as the only thing we're good for is to be thrown on the ground and trampled under the foot of men. Yet in the midst of that, Lord, we desire to serve you true and faithfully. Help us to do so, O God. Purify us of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Give us hearts hungry for you, desirous to draw close to you, to live for you. Lord, teach us how to do that. Lord, we thank you in each of our individual lives how far you've brought us, how many layers of the onion of America you have peeled off our lives to make us into people of your name, people of your possession. That we might live lives in glory to you, not in accommodation with the mores of this nation and the ways of this country, but to live according to the ways of your country, to be your people in the earth, your ambassadors, calling people to repentance and faith in Christ. Blessed is your holy name. May we do that this week. If we're too scared, O oh God, to talk to people, Lord, may we equip ourselves and prepare ourselves with literature to lay here and to lay there, to even be so bold as to hand it to someone and say, just as we're leaving, here's something you can read when you have time. Lord, embolden us by your Spirit. Those who may go out to Pride Fest this coming weekend, O oh God, may they see the need to pray, to draw close to you, to seek your face, to be prepared to wage war with the enemy, to declare your word, pick up their sword, your word, and declare it to men. Desire us to see your Holy Spirit convict the hearts of men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. To see lives transformed, new trophies of grace placed within your kingdom. Lord, let us not be so full and busy in our lives that we cannot take time to talk to others, to preach to others, to minister to others, O oh God, to point men to You. God, do it within all our lives, I pray. Blessed is Your holy name. We are in need of You, O oh God. We are a needy people. You are the vine. We are the branches. We can do nothing without You. Help us, O oh God. Praise Your name, Lord. Lord, may we shake off this dearth that hovers over the land and the complacent Christianity that is a stench upon our robes. 
And let us radically serve You in the earth, O God, in the way we conduct our lives, in the words which we declare, Your Word, to others, O Lord. Blessed is Your holy name. Praise Your holy name, O God. May we see that Your kingdom is a conquering kingdom. That where You're glorified, where men truly live for You, Your kingdom is expanded in the earth. May we see that we're part of the church and this is the vehicle through which you make yourself known in the earth. May our days on this earth count to the glory of your name and not to the building up of our own self-ambition. And I ask for these things in Jesus' holy name. Do it, do it in us all, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise his name. Could be seated. Praise his holy name. We're going to take communion. Observe his table, and you can feel free to participate in communion with us. You don't have to be a member of this church or something to partake at the Lord's table here. We do ask, however, that you be a Christian. Um, if you're not a Christian, we ask that you not take communion. But if you're a Christian, you've repented and believed in Christ. Feel free to partake at the Lord's table with us here at Mercy Seat. And we do observe His table every week here at Mercy Seat. Uh, we do that for a number of reasons. One, is, for example, is it's the tradition of the church to do so. It was the pattern laid out by the early church. So we follow in that pattern. Amen? And we observe His table each week that we meet. We also do it because we need to be reminded of this great salvation. What do you see at his table? Two elements plus nothing. The bread, which represents his body. The fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. Plus nothing. Signifying it's through Christ alone that we have access to the Father. Praise his holy name. This is why the writer of the Hebrews calls it a great salvation. He has procured it for us. We did not bring it about through our own hand. Amen? We accepted it only as a gift given to us by God Himself. Even after we become a Christian, though, it is easy for us to think that it's Jesus plus something we've done that gives us right standing with God. Is that not true? I've done it a hundred thousand times. This time at his table reminds us it's through Christ alone that we have right standing with God. It's not these two items plus a list of how many people I, how many hours I spent in prayer, how many good works I did this last week. It's these two elements alone, amen? Now, spending hours in prayer and doing good works, that's good to do. But what we need to remember is, we don't do those good things to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do those good things because we have obtained God's acceptance. And there's a world of difference between those two. There was a whole reformation that took place over that very issue. So it's important for us to remember that fact. The good works that we do, the holy living that we display, that is the fruit or the result or the evidence of our saving faith in Christ. We don't do those things to obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do them because we have obtained God's acceptance. Amen. Bless His holy name. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which He was betrayed took bread. When He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Was this literally his body? No. It's symbolic of his body. Amen? No, it wasn't literally his body because he was sitting there in his body while he was holding the piece of bread. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Showing that what Christ did at Calvary, where his body hung on the cross and his blood was poured out, 
That is the means whereby we obtain acceptance with God. We call what Jesus did at the cross the finished work of Christ. And the reason we call it the finished work of Christ is because the procurement of salvation was finished there. There is nothing we can do to add to the finished work of Christ. We can but accept and receive this great salvation through faith. This great gift of God to us. And I encourage all of you to do so. If anyone here hasn't done that, I encourage you to do so. Confess your sin to God. Ask Him to forgive you. Believe in Jesus. He will radically transform your life. There really is nothing to live for on planet Earth unless you're living for Him. It's all a big vain zero. You might be a little excited about certain aspects of your life right now. Been to the mall yesterday, got some nice clothes or whatever. But you know what? All, all in time, you see how vain it all is. What a zero it all is. What only really matters is living for Him. Following His ways and thoughts and living them out in our lives. Declaring them with our mouths. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks. We give praise to You. We rejoice that You have redeemed us not with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we give thanks to You that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies, You loved us. We thank You that Your Holy Spirit convicted us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That You've translated us into the kingdom of Your dear Son, Father. Lord, I ask and pray that we live our lives in service to You. That we live our lives in service to Him who died in our stead and not just following our own self-ambition. And I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah, Father. Let's stand and we'll worship Him and then I'll close in prayer. Hallelujah. A praise and honor unto you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy. I cry out to you day and night, O Lord. O Lord, you are found worthy to open the seals where you shed your blood. Blessed be your holy name. Father, I just ask and pray now that you be with each one here. Help each man to be a priest to his home and this week to open your word to his wife and to his children to talk to them about the things of God and travel. And as they're in the home, as they're out in the field working, wherever they may be, O God, may the things of you be upon our heart, upon our mind. Lord, I pray for each woman. Strengthen each one here with the many duties they have. Help each one to be a helpmate to their husband and accomplishing all you've given him to do. Lord, may she be an anchor in the home, a nurturer of the children in the faith and a fealty to you. Lord, I pray for each child. May they be a blessing to their parents. Desire us to be obedient, to honor them, even as your word teaches us. May each young person here use their strength to the glory of your name. May they fall on their faces before you, prostrate before you, saying, Lord, what would you have me to do with my life? Lord, I pray for each single person that they use their time wisely in service to you. I pray and ask, O God, that you be with all those of us with gray hair. Help us to be an example of godliness to our progeny, our children, our grandchildren, and even our great-grandchildren, O God. Praise your holy name. Even in our old age, O God, continue to purify us, sanctify us, make us more like you. We thank you for how much you've done in our lives. We ask that we not become complacent, but that we allow you to continue to mold us and shape us into who you want us to be regarding godly living. I ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you.